Okay, well, the rest of our attendees can come join in while I go through a basic introduction. So my name is Jessica Keegan. I'm from the Office of Economic Empowerment. I'm a program officer. I'll explain what the Office of Economic Empowerment is in a moment. If you haven't heard before, and thank you to all of those who have attended the remainder of the session in our series, who the spiel might sound a little bit familiar for, we appreciate your patience and your continued attendance. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So first, I'll just welcome you into this session, go through a few disclosures and housekeeping. We'll be able to participate in the amazing part, excuse me, the amazing presentation, no coffee yet, on the basics of home buying with Dutch and the folks at m and and you'll be able to use the Q&A function to ask any questions, and we might have time at the end for some Q&A. So just if you do not know the Office of Economic Empowerment, we deliver programs to all residents of Massachusetts at every stage of their lives, regardless of their economic background. We also offer initiatives tailored to meet the unique financial experience of veterans, women, high school students, and older adults, which is why we are here today partnering with the Executive Office of Elder Affairs to deliver you this workshop. So you may have noticed that this is a Zoom webinar. It will be recorded and it will be able to be uploaded onto a public website for future use, but I will share the recording with everybody who registered today. So that way you can share it with your networks, watch over parts you may have missed um, or generally share it. So we are a public agency. So the chat record is still subject to public record laws and is not anonymous. However, you can ask questions through the Q&A function and those will show as anonymous. So you may have noticed that this is a webinar, not a meeting, so you will not be able to turn on your cameras or turn on your microphone. You will be still muted, but that's okay because if you have anything you'd like to tell us, you can use the chat function or the Q&A to ask questions. And the moment that you exit out of this Zoom webinar, you'll be able to see a post survey populate. Go ahead and complete that. It'll let us know if you like what we're doing and if you want to see more of this. Um, it can only help, but it's only a few questions. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to the folks at m and Bank. Thank you all for joining us. I know we have a huge squad here um, and we are super appreciative. And good morning. And thank you, Jessica, for that nice introduction. Hey, Dutch, let we can see your notes. Sorry? We can see your uh, notes. All right, good. Let me make sure we change that. Thank you very much. Swap. There you go. How's that? Yeah, better. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. So um, super excited to be with you. My name is Dutch Koltoff, and the other voice you just heard was the voice of Jordan Green, the handsome man in this picture. And together, we are the financial empowerment team uh, at m and Bank. Um, our bank's purpose is really to make a difference in people's lives and to uplift our communities. And we truly feel that after the pandemic, financial education is more important than ever. So I'm happy that you've joined our workshop today, and hopefully you've had a chance to join this series of workshop, right? This is number four in the series. And when I look outside, I can't um, just wonder about a month ago, we were pretty much sitting in the dark when we started, and now we have a little light. Um, so we're moving towards uh, longer days. And even though we haven't had a winter, uh, it's kind of nice to be able to say that, you know, the days are getting longer, we're getting to better uh, temperatures. And if you've been with us the last four weeks, I truly appreciate and if this is your first workshop, just a quick goal, objective, and reminder around what we're trying to do today. Um, our overall goal is to share some additional resources, share some additional education around financial strategies, uh, give you resources, give you tips that you can use yourself, that you can use with your family, and also something that you can use when you work with the elderly. We realize that on your day-to-day -day work, um, you work with a very vulnerable um, population, um, and we've talked in the past few weeks about budgeting, we talked about savings, we talked about credit score and scam protection. So we've had a lot of resources already come to the forefront that hopefully you can use in your day-to-day -day work. And it's important to remember that other resources are always available to you. It's not just these workshops that are recorded, but our partnership with the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and the Office of Economic Empowerment does include the ability to share their resources with you as well. And there's some great resources that they have available online that we'll share with you later. Um, none of these trainings are designed to turn you into financial advisors or offer you any type of certification. It's truly meant to give you additional education on financial activities 
And we do recommend that any time that you have a personal need or a deeper question, that you reach out to your own trusted financial expert and review your personal scenarios with them. And we're doing it ourselves today. So we have a pretty uh, large agenda around home buying, considering home ownership today. But I'm happy that we also have our own specialists. And if there is Q&As that come up throughout um, the workshop, feel free to put those in this chat. We'll try to answer those. And we actually have a couple of our mortgage officers from M&T Bank with us today. Um, I see Jim on camera, and I've also included uh, both Jim's and Eric's phone number and email. So if there's no ability to get your questions answered throughout the day. Um, feel free, if it's possible, to reach out to of, well, any of us, and we'll try to make sure we can help you. So that's the goals, the objectives from Q&A, just a little update on what we're trying to do. And I think what's important, we'll get into it, all right? So when we talk about considering home ownership today, uh, we're gonna talk a bit about what you should look for if you're considering home ownership, uh, some basics around mortgage terms, some strategies and tips, and then we'll share some resources and some next steps. And like we always do, and we do it every week, uh, just to make sure you're awake, you've had your coffee and you're fully engaged, let's start with a poll. Why are you on this call? I assume you're considering buying a home. So what's the top reason? Why are you wanting to purchase a home? Is it to raise a family and have a safe, secure place? You just want a permanent address? You think it will help you give you additional security for the future? You wanna move upward in life or is it to create additional wealth and increase your assets? Go ahead, just some possibilities for um, purchasing a home. Do me a favor and vote. And then Jessica, if I can ask you to close the poll just to kind of see what the initial reason is why people are interested in buying a home. Uh, it's a good mix. And most of them is really have to do with wealth, uh, creating wealth, increasing assets. Thank you all. Thank you all for sharing that. So, you know, purchasing a home continues to be a goal for many, many people, right? And often of the largest financial decisions that you'll make in your lives. So it's also important to consider that when you want to purchase a home, um, there's pros and cons, like with every decision. And purchasing a home might not be the right choice for everyone. Uh, I'll give you my own example. If, if you've been on these calls before, I've shared with you, I was an immigrant, moved in from the Netherlands 25 years ago. And my initial goal was to live the American dream. So I bought way too much things on credit. I purchased a home when I shouldn't have. I didn't know what a budget was. And one of the reasons that I'm so excited about financial education, because I pretty, pretty much made every single mistake that you could possibly do when it comes to finances. And I believe financial education would have helped me um, reach my goals a little bit differently. And when I looked at owning a home, and I've owned two homes in the past, uh, one of the things that I realized quickly um, is when you look at the pros and cons from owning a home, your home is an asset, the value of your home may go up over time. Well, I lived in Florida in 2007, and I can tell you that my home value went from about 425000 to about 150000 in less than six months. So you also got to understand that where you own a home, that the value of your home may also go down over time. Pros and cons from making a payment. Yes, you make a monthly payment and you get closer to ownership, um, but you might have to save a lot of money up front, specifically comparing to renting. You might need more money uh, to be able to purchase the drone that you're really looking for. People often forget about taxes, right? Um, you have to pay taxes. You have to make sure that you pay your taxes on a home at all times, same as insurance. Um, now you can deduct some of those taxes in some cases, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I'm quite happy being a renter and not having to worry about the monthly tax bill. This is where my wife and I disagree. You can remodel your home any way you'd like. Yes, when you own your home, you can color and do and, and make it any, any specific scenario that you're happy about. When you're watching HGTV, you can copy it. You're also responsible for all the repair and the maintenance cost. I love the fact that I live in a 100-year-old home. And when we had a flooding issue and we had a furnace issue, I just had to call the landlord. They came out and took care of it for me. Um, I live on the ocean in Swampscott. I have always wanted to live on the ocean. This was supposed to be a two-year rental, and then I was going to purchase a home again. It's now been 10 years. I love renting. So this pros and cons to owning a home, and it's one of the main reasons for this webinar is to help you understand, you know, it's important for you as an individual to make the right choice for yourself. And if there's some peer pressure around being an homeowner, just a homeowner, 
just make sure that it makes sense for you and that you've uh, taken all your personal considerations into consideration before you decide to take that step uh, and get ready to purchase. Now, at the end of the day, I do want to be a homeowner again someday. I do think there's a lot of additional benefits around homeownership. Um, and, and hopefully we'll give you some ideas today that can help you um, with strategies to get ready to purchase a home. So those are personal considerations. Let's take a look at some of the considerations that a financial institution would consider. And they're, they're called the five C's of credit. Capacity, uh, your present and future ability to meet your payments. Are you able to pay for the home that you would like? I wouldn't be able to afford a, uh, living in a house, owning a home right on the beach. So rental was an option for me. Capital, your assets, mostly cash, savings, investments that you can turn around and quickly use for cash if needed either for down payments to purchase a home or if there were some type of emergency. What type of assets do you have to secure the loan? In this case, what is the home that you're looking to buy? Um, is that the type of collateral that makes sense for the money that you're uh, being asked to, uh, to borrow? The character, your history of delivering on commitments, really your credit history, right? We've talked about that in a previous class. Do you have a payment history where you have shown that you can handle different payment structures that you can handle making payments on time. Uh, and especially if a finance institution wants to offer you this large mortgage for a home, um, is there some security for us to make sure that your history of doing so? And then other overall conditions, what are the purpose of the loan and factors that might impact the loan, might impact your ability to repay? Um, what type of job scenario do you have? Do we see a history where you've been in the same job for some time or are you somebody who switches jobs every year? Just considerations we need to look at when a financial institution um, decides to enter into agreement with you to purchase a home. So the five C's of credit. So what can you do? How can you make sure um, that those five C's that a financial institution has looked at are going to be met by you? And, and here's just some uh, pretty much a quick list how you can prepare for a, for a mortgage. And if you attended our previous workshops, you might recognize a few of these budgets, right? We've talked about budgeting and savings. We talked about visualizing your dream, um, credit workshops around preparing your credit score and credit reporting and making sure that you have all your documents in a good and secure place. And truly when it comes to purchasing a home, prepare, 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 research and get as much information ready as possible early on. We're gonna go to most of these topics uh, in more detail but the whole mortgage and application experience will be more streamlined, less stressful if you have the chance to prepare ahead of time. And something really key to remember when you prepare and plan, while there's many examples, while there's many calculators online, it's important to notice that each mortgage, each application, and each individual scenario is different. There's no sample, there's no standard, simple, one size fits all to mortgage and home buying. Truly, each person's rates, cost, experience will be different. And, and my audience I know today is, is, is young employees. You're working with seniors. It's important to know that there's very different factors that come into play uh, when you try and when you get ready to prepare for a mortgage. So we're going to go to most of these topics, but I'm actually going to start with number two, getting your credit score. Just as a reminder, credit is important. Your ability to repay is based on that snapshot of the credit score and the credit history uh, indicates to a lender. Um, and we've talked before that your payment history, your amounts owed and your length of credit history are quite important. Types of credit used and new credit. Um, you can easily get your credit reports at annualcreditreport.com, which gives you the opportunity to get your report from all three agencies. And one recommendation we would have when we think about planning and we think about resourcing We'd, we'd likely and we strongly recommend that you start looking at your report at least three months before, before you want to start applying for mortgages. You don't want to, a week before you find your dream home, pull out your credit report and find out that there's errors, that there's issues that need to be disputed. So at least three months before you start the process, take a good look at your credit report, make sure that everything that's on there is clean and clear. We also strongly recommend that you do not apply for any new credit or new loans in that same window of time, right? With their scenarios, and I've heard this, where people are about to buy a home and they're like, yeah, since we knew we were going to buy a home, we went to a furniture place and we got all the furniture and we got some nice uh, credit loans. Uh-oh, and I see Jim shaking his head and nodding his head. 
What that means to a lender is all of a sudden, all these calculations that we've made to get this mortgage ready for you have changed because you have new credit. Your credit score changed. You have new obligations that you need to pay. It might impact your score. So best thing to do, get everything ready a few months beforehand when you start shopping around. Wait till you have the keys in your hands and then go to Home Depot, then go to the furniture stores and, and do what you want to do if it still makes sense within your budget. Um, but try not to do so before you do the mortgage. So credit score is an important piece and new credit, types of credit use is a very important piece. So you don't wanna apply for new items right in the middle of the mortgage process. Then it comes to budgeting, right? So we're gonna use an example of Miss Christina who has a full-time job um, and has about $75,000 a year. She uh, enjoyed the workshops with Dutch the last couple of weeks and created her own savings plan she visualized the home that she wanted to buy, has that picture on her fridge, separately her monthly expenses into absolute needs and wants, um, has an automatic savings plan that's actually part of her budget. Uh, and now she's ready to kind of say, all right, what type of home would I be able to afford? What budget uh, would I have to purchase a home? And you can see that we kind of put a simulated budget on the screen with rent, credit card, car expenses, household expenses, food, groceries, transportation, but separating those needs and those wants. Now, the very first item to consider when you're looking at a budget and with all these calculators that we have online is what we call the debt to income ratio. So how much of your income should be spent on a mortgage payment, on a debt, or overall debts? And to calculate the debt to income ratio, we actually would look not just obviously at the full income, but we kind of look at the expenses that are set and fixed each month that need to be met. So in this case, a minimum payment on a credit card needs to be met. Car expenses need to be met. Savings could change, household expenses could change, student loans needs to be met. Food and groceries could change, transportation could change, clothing could change. So when we look at all these needs, truly from a debt to income perspective, we're gonna be looking at minimum payments on the credit card, the car expenses and the student loan to calculate the debt to income. And in our example, that's a total of $425. Now, does that mean that's the only money that Christina should consider when she purchases a home? Absolutely not, right? And we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more later on. But when it comes to a debt to income calculation, as a financial institution, we would look at the monthly income, $75,000 divided by 12, the gross income, divided by these $425 of payments that we know need to be met each month, and then we get to a 43% maximum debt to income. That's kind of a guideline where we feel that somebody that meets the strong income requirements, meets the strong credit requirements, has shown a history of items uh, being paid on time, that 43% is kind of a maximum guideline that lenders might consider for a total payment um, for debts. So in this case, 2687 is at 43% of the monthly income, We'll take the $425 out and Christina might qualify. And here's this might again, it depends on our personal scenario, but she might qualify for a payment of $2,262.50. And that's how a debt to income is calculated. Now just two little highlights before I move to the next slide. That doesn't mean that Christina should be spending $2,262.50 each month fully on a mortgage. Right? We saw there's groceries, you saw there's food, there's income. There's other costs that Christina is very well aware of. And that's why it's so important that you first create a budget, that you look at your wants and your needs, and that you understand what percentage you are comfortable with as an individual versus what a debt to income ratio might pop up with. Right? So the individual scenario continues to be super, super important. And it's important to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that's important is that there's other costs that are part of this maximum monthly payment for qualifying, right? That number is not just a principal on a mortgage. When it comes to a payment that is calculated um, for a mortgage, that amount includes the principal for the amount borrowed. It includes the interest that needs to be paid on the amount borrowed. It includes those taxes. It includes homeowners insurance. Right? So there's fixed costs that are part of this payment. And depending on where you live and depending on the value of the home, that can be quite large. So you can reduce 
some of those overall costs if you've saved a lot of money ahead of time in a down payment. Uh, but if you haven't, and if you didn't have enough money for a down payment, we'll talk about private mortgage insurance. The lender might say, I'm a little nervous because you're borrowing a lot of money and you're really close to your overall debt to income. We might want to add and enforce some additional insurance that you now have to pay every month. Uh, there might be other fees that come up uh, around the mortgage process. And you'll see how important it is to save money ahead of time. So all of this to summarize um, and, 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 and just really um, put an exclamation point on the discussion around each scenario, each individual scenario is different. Um, don't just use online calculators to say, all right, look at that. I should be approved for this amount and then be surprised if you apply for a mortgage and you haven't talked to somebody like Jim before and said, okay, is this really the best thing for me? It's important to have that discussion with a specialized advisor and make sure that what you're looking to do fits in your overall budget, right? So talked a little bit about um, the cost to consider when you're looking at your budget um, and how buying a home is more than just saving for a down payment. So there are additional miscellaneous fees to consider that can help uh, to appraise the house, make sure the house is safe and protected. And there's additional closing costs to consider to help record the mortgage legally, find attorneys um, and, and verify the documents. Uh, in some cases, realtors and attorneys uh, might take a look at these miscellaneous costs and the closing costs to see if they could be shared by the seller or the buyer negotiation. But again, there's a lot of additional costs that come um, to make up that, that total debt to income payment uh, and not all of them are directly part of the mortgage. So let's look at each of these down payment, miscellaneous cost and closing costs a little bit more detail. And we'll start with the down payment. So down payment is a cash payment towards the purchase of a home normally ranges between three and 20% um, for a standard mortgage. Now there's many, many programs in place to help home buyers purchase a home with a smaller down payment. And I'm actually gonna share an example in a second um, through mass housing. And, and I see Eric joined to call and, and Jim on the call. And this is one of the reasons that you want to have the ability to talk to specialists and advisors, because when there's so many programs available, you want to be able to see if you have an individual scenario that could fit some from these programs that are out there. And I'll give you an example. I told you I'm a renter. I've owned two homes before, but I've been renting for close to 10 years. I haven't had any type of investment property for the last five years. What I didn't realize is that at 50 years old, I'm actually a new home buyer. First time home buyer, right? Because from a legal perspective, I haven't owned a home for the last three years. There's programs in place that even though I'm 50, I can be considered a first time home buyer. And because of that, there's programs available for me as a first time home buyer. I had no idea. I didn't think that was possible. I talked to a specialist and they go, oh, if you haven't saved enough, guess what? There's some programs you might qualify for. So in this specific example, we're gonna go back to our example. Um, and, and um, Christina actually found a family home that looked like it's on the market for $310,000. She had enough save for a 3% down payment, about 9,300. Now there is a housing program in Massachusetts that allowed her to purchase this based on her overall income and on her individual scenario without mortgage insurance. So her overall loan would be just over $300,000. Rates, uh, we put a rate in from a couple of weeks ago. Um, which then gave her a principal and interest payment of $1,745 for this mortgage. Taxes and home insurance were estimated in this scenario. And you'll see that the total amount, if you put the principal, interest, the taxes, and the home insurance together, $2,245 is an amount that is lower than that overall debt to income. So this would be good news for Christina. We're thinking that with the money she saved, with the programs that she qualified for, and with the budget that she made, we think she'd be qualified to put together uh, a pre-approval or an, an offer to make this work. Um, income, location of where you live in Massachusetts, actually, your credit history. There's restrictions and opportunities to see if you qualify for any of these special programs. Um, and again, today is not the platform to discuss each of those programs separately, um, but the Federal Housing Administration, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are names that you might have heard of. The Department of Veterans Affairs um, offers specific mortgage options um, for veterans. 
the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA Rural Development Housing Service, no department, different grants and loans. There's a lot of different programs that are, could be unique to your scenario. Um, and I've mentioned it now for four weeks in a row, and it's, it's on the first slide that I talk, talk to a trusted advisor when you get ready um, to make this biggest decision in your life, right? If you don't qualify for a specialty program, if you can't um, um, qualify for a lower payment and get grants or discounts, you still might be able to purchase a home with less than a 20% down payment safe. Like I told you, I'm a first time home buyer, but my income will probably disqualify me for a lot of specialty programs. So what the lender would then do, they would add private mortgage insurance to my payment, uh, at least until I'm at that 80% total level. Um, and that private mortgage insurance is insurance that the bank will add to protect their investments into the mortgage. And it's something that when you calculate your mortgage payments, you just have to keep in mind, right? So if you don't qualify for grants or loan or different options, you could still have the ability to purchase a home with a lower down payment as long as uh, you are ready to then possibly pay private mortgage insurance. So that's the whole down payment scenario to consider when you're looking to purchase a home. We talked about some other costs, right? Uh, miscellaneous costs. Here are a few examples to consider. And many of these relate to the property itself, not to the financial documents, but to the property. And I, I'm always very careful with these. Um, we've been in a very hot housing market, right? So there's people that uh, you might have multiple bits on the house that you would really like. So you might say to yourself, you know what, I might have a higher chance if I waive the inspection, if I don't worry about some of the repairs that the house might need. Um, and I've lived in a home in New England that was 100 years old. I would strongly recommend that you don't do that uh, and that you make sure that at least the inspection um, is taken into consideration um, when you take a look at a home. Repair costs that the house might need and ongoing costs. And, and, and one example that always comes up for me moving up here from Florida, um, I had no idea how expensive it was to um, use oil to heat a home my first winter. So when that oil truck pulled up and charged me $5,000, I'm like, what the heck? That's ongoing cost that I was not considering because I had central air in South Florida and I walked around in my uh, shorts all day. Things were different when I came to Massachusetts. So that's an ongoing cost that I had to consider for my budgeting. Um, are there specific taxes? Are there uh, specific appraisal costs in place that come into this property? Um, I, I, I know I'm starting to sound like I'm trying to scare everybody into buying a home, but I think it's just really important to understand that when you calculate what you think you can afford, it's not just, okay, I got a percent for a down payment and I think I'm within my budget. Let's go and make this happen. There is additional costs that you really need to consider that can vary with each home. Um, to the same thing, closing cost, right? The actual cost to purchase the home and document the purchase legally. Um, and this, uh, Closing cost by itself is normally between two to 5% of the total purchase price. So you have at least 3% for a down payment. You now have two to 5% for closing costs. You have some additional cost. There's a good amount of money up front that you need to consider uh, before you look at a home. Appraisal, tax service, title insurance, making sure that nobody else can put a claim on the home. And these are all items that you don't want waived. These are all items that even in a negotiation on a home, you want to make sure it's taken care of. Don't say I don't want them done. If there is a negotiation possible, maybe the seller is willing to pay some of these. Maybe they can reduce the price to take care of some of these. But again, that's why you have legal experts in place um, before you decide to pull a home. Down payment, miscellaneous costs, closing costs. So all of that ahead of time before you say, hey, let's take a look and purchase this home. Um, so then you're ready to, so you found your home, you kind of have things figured out, now it's time to actually get a mortgage, right? So Jim and Eric would love to help you. There's other financial institutions that would love to help you, right? Conventional loans, mortgage loans provided to the people that meet the criteria that we've discussed from an income perspective, from a debt to income perspective, from a credit course perspective, um, conventional mortgages. Uh, there's a lot of ways for you um, to research and find companies that can help you. Um, and, and you want to make sure, again, that you deal with a reputable company. Even through these companies, you also have access to government-backed loans. 
um, that can help with the down payment, like the Federal Housing Administration, Federal Administration, and the USDA that we discussed earlier. Um, you don't need to directly try to reach out to the FHA. Most uh, mortgage specialists would be able to help you and research the different options that are available to you. Um, and it's important that you do. Like, how can I make sure that the home that I would like to buy fits within the budget that I have and fits within the money that I've saved? So a lot of different options and loans available to you. And even within mortgages in themselves, um, there's different options. You have the choice between fixed mortgages and adjustable rate mortgages. So fixed mortgage is exactly um, the way it sounds. You have a fixed rate for a fixed term. The most common one is probably a 30-year mortgage, right? You have a set amount of money and you say, all right, for the next 30 years, I'm going to pay the exact same amount. I'm going to have the exact same interest rate. And hopefully by the end of 30 years, I hold a home. It's a good idea in a very low rate environment. Uh, two, three years ago, I think a lot of people, even if they had other mortgages, would have gone to the bank and say, hey, can I change what mortgage I have to a fixed rate mortgage for a longer period of time? It might be helpful. Um, the, the, the rate environment that we're currently are in is a bit different, right? Rates have gone up the last couple of years. Um, and something to consider might be what's called an adjustable rate mortgage. And especially if you're a first time home buyer, on average, people live in their first home five to seven years. So with an adjustable rate mortgage, just like the word says, you have the option to get a lower rate. Let's say you do a seven year adjustable rate mortgage. You actually get a lower rate for the first seven years. After seven years, the rate would change to whatever the rate environment indicates then. So unfortunately it could be higher, could be lower. Take a little bit of a gamble there. But if you're thinking, you know what, this is my first home, this is not my end dream home, this might be a really good thing to consider right now to get a lower payment and to have the ability uh, to afford a home that five, seven years down the line might help you with a resell and a better payment at the moment. Um, again, something to consider, both ways could work. Um, but within the mortgage, you have these options, right? And even within a fixed mortgage, you have different options based on interest rate, 15-year um, or 30-year. Do you want to pay your mortgage once a month or do you want to pay bi-weekly? There's ways that you, even with a fixed mortgage, can pay the mortgage off a little bit quicker, might be able to save some interest rates, or within the initial term of 30 years, you have the ability to refinance to maybe a lower rate or a different term. So the conversation between you and the mortgage lender, the conversation between the mortgage specialist, between the bank needs to be ongoing depending on your scenario, right? If you buy a dream home, you get a good rate and you're fixed, fantastic, in good shape. But most people find themselves in different scenarios. Uh, and just like we've talked in previous workshop, if there's a life-changing event, maybe it's a good time to also talk and look at your mortgage scenario again. Um, my 18-year-old daughter just got accepted in college. Huh, that actually will change how I feel about the budget that I might have for a mortgage. And I see both the mortgage guys laughing. Yeah, it's not fun, let me tell you. Um, now, I'm lucky. She's going to go to the Netherlands, I think. And in the Netherlands, a annual cost for college is about $3,000. Yay! Versus what some of the U.S. schools are trying to offer. Her. So maybe I'll luck out. But what's important for me now that we're thinking about getting back into the real estate market is that my budget just changed. Right. So I need to make sure that I keep that in mind that for the next four years, at least, I have different budget requirements than I had even a year ago. And within a mortgage, you can always have that discussion. And if you have a good relationship, uh, with guys like Jim and Eric, you can reach out to them and say, hey, is this something I should consider right now? Um, so it's never simple. Right. Rate, fees, down payments, they all impact the total of the amounts that are paid. Uh, and it all expects all the aspects depend on you individually, right? And and I saw one of my colleagues at, um, at one of our meetings, and they were saying, you know, the number one question that people always get, hey, what's the current mortgage rate? And the standard answer, it depends, right? Uh, it's easy to quote a low rate. It's easy to say, all right, the low rate, look at that, is a 4% rate. Isn't that fantastic? Um, but when you start looking at fees, when you start looking at down payments, when you start to look at individual scenarios, when you start looking at terms, your personal scenario is different than mine. So your rate will be different than mine. 
So sure, can I quote you a super low rate? Absolutely. Look at the fine print, find out what it talks about when it talks about specialty programs, credit scores, and, and really make sure that it applies to you or even better, have a conversation with somebody that can help. Um, a good summary slide of what we discussed so far today, right? And I'm actually moving a little faster than normal, so we might have some time to open up later on, but um, start with monitoring and if needed, improving your credit score, right? AndrewCreditReport.com, uh, we shared in our workshop around credit scores that a lot of credit cards and a lot of banks now give you access to your report and give you access to your score. So again, about three months before you get serious, pull this report, take a good look, make sure there's no issues or disputes. Um, and when you do your budgeting and when you start thinking about home ownership, start saving towards your dream of home ownership and try to save as much as you can, not just for a down payment, as I mentioned here, but also for the other costs uh, that we discussed. I would actually flip three and four. Find a lender that you can trust before you start comparing, right? Talk to a specialist. Talk to guys like Jim and Eric. Talk to somebody who can look at your individual scenario and give you some options, give you some ideas, give you some suggestions that a Google search didn't give you, right? That's what they do. Um, and, and it's important that you have that conversation so that you have then the ability to compare all the different options, compare all the different costs that are available to you um, before you make the decision to move on next, right? When you feel you're somewhat ready, okay. One of the most important things you can get, and I don't even know if you can look for a home without a pre-qualification or pre-approval letter. I've had realtors pretty much say, well, I don't wanna to talk to you unless you've shown me that you've done your homework ahead of time, that you've talked through all your options, you've actually gone through a mortgage specialist and you've gotten one of these pre-qualifications or pre-approvals, which shows me not only that you're serious about purchasing a home, but there's a high likelihood that if I put your offer on the table with the sellers, um, that we can actually make this work. So a pre-qualification or a pre-approval is when your mortgage lender takes a look at your pre-work, helps estimate your debt to income, your payments and likely approved amounts, and pretty much gives you a letter that says, all right, based on what we've seen, we think Dutch can qualify for this amount. So Dutch can start looking at houses within that amount. Um, some good mortgage uh, specialists might actually send you reminders that there's different houses popping up in the market that fit the scenario that you're interested in and kind of help you with that search. Um, the application itself, when it comes to estimates and loan offers and settlements, frankly, I'm gonna skip all that, not just from a time perspective, but also cause that is truly information that comes into play when you found that home and you're ready to sit down and make them and, and crunch the numbers. And most of this workshop is around the preparation before you start shopping and looking around, right? Um, but hopefully what I've showed you is that there's resources available. If you still wanna look at other resources, the Truth and Lending Act, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, USA.gov, there is a lot of online resources to kind of give you a framework for some of the same items I just discussed. Um, that can help kind of guide you, which direction can I go? What are some of the options I should consider? Other specific questions uh, that I should bring up when I talk to a, a, a mortgage specialist. I'll, I'll give you a quick example, right? I'm an immigrant. So I have a green card. I'm not officially a US citizen. There's some of these programs that don't apply to me, but they apply to my wife. So maybe there's a way that my wife would apply instead of me. Uh, there's different scenarios to look for and doing a little bit of resource ahead of time can help. Uh, it's also a question you can ask when you eventually meet with your lender. Um, I mentioned early on that each person and each individual scenario is different. So I'm gonna go back on the top, right? Probably the most, one of the most important things I can share with you um, is that with all the homework you do, with all the preparation that you do, with all the activities that we want to make sure you do it correctly, um, because each individual scenario is different and there's so many resources available. Um, they've been answering in the chat, but Eric and Jim are on the call now. There's their phone numbers, there's their emails. If you have additional questions and you're like, wow, I'm closer than I thought, or I'm way off, or just some things that came up in this chat that I didn't think about, we'd be more than happy to help you. 
not just from a sales perspective, that's always important to mention if you heard me say that in, in these workshops, M&T Bank wants to help our community, right? So we're not just doing this to say, all right, absolutely. Let's make sure we make this work. If you have suggestions, if you have ideas for you, you your family, if you're dealing with the elderly population, you're like, you know, there are actually are scenarios in the home that I work, in the facility that I work, where different people have asked me questions around home purchase. Um, feel free to reach out to us either via chat or email. We'd love to do so. So it's important to understand your own personal, personal financial readiness. Check your credit, check your ratios, and review all the different costs that are associated individually before you purchase a home is a summary of some of the items we discuss right now. Um, I'm gonna open it up in just a second, but just a quick reminder, the last steps um, in our last and fourth workshop, there is this exit survey. We'd like you to give honest feedback because we wanna do this quarterly. We wanna make sure that we continue to update the information that we share. So if you wanted to see additional content or comment on Dutch, please do so. It will only help us get better. Like we shared last week, there's online resources with the Office of Economic Empowerment and the Executive Office of Elder Affairs that can guide you through different steps um, and, and home buying and home ownership are actually topics that are discussed on both websites. And myfinanciallifema.org offers those five to 10 minute digital modules where you can actually say, all right, everything the Dutch said sounded kind of cool. I just want to in my own time interactively learn a few more details. Go to myfinanciallifema.org. You can go through the OEE website. You go directly to the Commonwealth website. You can find it actually on mtb.com. But there's digital modules that you can interact, type in personal answers, and just get some more detail for your personal scenario. So some good resources that are available to you um, with the company and the employment that you work for. I see additional, um, which I think is really awesome. I see in the chat, um, Jessica and Eric and Jim all have added information um, that talks around um, home buying. And I'm actually going to open it up for a second. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So we have everybody back in the same picture. But I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And if there are additional Q&As or chats, I'm certain uh, that we can all try to jump in and answer. And if not, we can try to do that later on via email or chat as well. Thank Back you for you, a fantastic presentation. Uh, you can tell we've been getting some great engagement today. So I did have a question from the attendees. So at all of these workshops we've been having, Dutch, you've been mentioning this annual free credit report. When you check your credit report using that free tool, does it affect your credit score? Absolutely not. So, and you can actually check it more than once a year. So um, the nice thing about, um, your annual credit report and, and you personally looking at your own credit report is that it does not affect your score. Um, and in fact, what used to be a once a year type of event um, has changed in the pandemic. You can now pull your own credit more often if you'd like to. I, I don't know if I would pull it weekly, but you can at least quarterly look at all three agencies and make sure everything that's on there is correctly. It's called a soft inquiry or your own personal inquiry. It will not impact your score at all. Great question. Fantastic. And I know that Jim did attack this question in the Q&A and thank you for doing so, Jim. But I know we have a great team of specialists here and a lot of folks in the audience who work directly alongside older adults. So I'd love to get some points um, on this question from each of you, if you'd be willing to share about the benefits for older adults or seniors to rent instead of buying a home after downsizing from a larger home. And we need to open that to Jim or Eric, because I don't know. <laughs> so I, don't know. Uh, I, I took myself off of mute. I'll comment first here. And it's Dutch, you said the words that I said to you in a meeting recently, whenever I'm posed with these questions, is it always, it depends. Um, one of the things you have to think about, and this is more of a maybe a financial advisor question than a question to Jim or I, is what does the elderly person have for assets that they're going to be you know, eating into, for lack of a better word, to live for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years versus if you still go and you downsize and you buy, let's say, a smaller condo, when you sell the big home, the idea would be 
you're maybe even paying cash potentially for a smaller condo. Now your living expense of taxes and insurance might be cheaper than what you're paying for rent. So the downsizing buying a property allows you to live cheaper than potentially renting, again, depending on where you're going to live. So you'd really have to see the situation. A financial advisor or someone like myself would want to see what you have for assets to make sure you're not going to outlive your assets. We're living longer as an elder uh, population. And we're starting to see that retirement age that used to be 61, 63 is now 65, 67 because we're living longer and we don't have enough assets. So you'd want to speak to someone like us, definitely, but maybe a financial advisor question. Jim, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I would echo, I would echo exactly what Eric is sharing, you know, as far as the financial side of it. Um, I also think we have to consider, you know, in renting, you know, it, it's less stable. But then if you own a property, you could be forced to move for whatever reason. The owner perhaps sells the property. Uh, there's always the chance that rents, as, as, as we've seen now in the last few years, rents could continue to climb, which makes it you know, a bit more unpredictable in planning a budget you know, for anyone, particularly a senior with a, a fixed income. Uh, so I think all of these are considerations. Uh, there is no right answer to this question. It's going to be unique and based on the individual and, and, and where they are. Thank you both so much for addressing that question. And I appreciate you expanding on your answer, Jim. I know that we have a lot of folks who work alongside Council on Aging and um, other organizations like that. So I felt like they would benefit. Um, we did have a question about the average cost to meet with a mortgage specialist. You don't need to deep dive into the cost to meet with a mortgage specialist. Um, but with M&T, with other banks, with other opportunities, um, would you be able to elaborate on how to meet with a mortgage specialist um, outside of just the government resources that we shared. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think I can speak for Eric um, and anybody here at MNT, you know, for an initial consultation, pre-approval, any of that stuff, there is certainly no cost to do that. Um, it's probably true with the many uh, financial institutions, but certainly I know it's true here. Uh, there'd be no cost initially for a pre-approval consultation, a series of questions, any of that type of stuff is uh, certainly complimentary. And I just want to jump in quickly on that, right? So as much as I appreciate Jim and Eric being on the call, I do want to make sure that there's a difference between, hey, I want some additional, I have some knowledge questions. Like, I just want to know more about the process. Reach out to Dutch and Jordan. That's my job, right? Financial education, helping you with resources. That's the way to go. If you're a little bit closer and you're like, hey, I've done some research and I think I'm actually getting closer to making a decision, then absolutely, I think your financial institution can help you. Jim and Eric can help you and look at those pre-approvals, but but feel free to reach out to me when you're like, hey, Dutch, I didn't understand the difference between fixed and adjustable. Can you share that with me versus, you know what, I got a certain amount of money saved and ready to jump into the market, um, which is a little different scenario. Yep. I'm your educator. They're, they're the ones that can help you get your house. Yes, that's what these workshops are all about, and especially this partnership with M&T, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, and the Office of Economic Empowerment. A lot of long titles there. Um, I will gladly once more put my email in the chat, um, and Jordan or Dutch, if you would like to reshare yours in the chat. Um, we're always open for questions, and we should definitely be that first stop for um, any questions you might have for financial education. And I will use this time to shamelessly plug myfinanciallifema.org, um, which is a free website for you to be able to work through some of these questions on your own um, with your personal situations too. If you feel like you aren't um, willing or able to talk to somebody else about it first, I understand how everybody wants to be self-sufficient sometimes. And it's nice to be able to go through those learning modules on your own. Okay, I know we still have a solid amount of people here. Um, so I'm wondering if other people have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A or the chat. Um, we'll pause for that on this moment while we wait for people to answer or ask, excuse me. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions unless folks are typing out some lengthy uh, answers, which is maybe why I'm adding a couple words to this, just in case people feel like they would like to ask more, but don't want to uh, rush their questions. If you do have any other questions, you can 
definitely, definitely reach out to any of the emails in the chat. The Ex Office of Economic Empowerment is always happy to field any questions to each of the organizations, so to m and or to EOEA in these aspects. And regardless, thank you all for coming. Thank you to all of our fantastic presenters for being fantastic resources. And of course, once you exit this uh, presentation, please feel free to answer our exit survey to let us know how we did. Uh, but I'll turn it back to the M&T folks if they have anything they'd like to say to close. I, I, I'm just, this is this was the fourth in a series of workshop and I just really uh, enjoy the partnership. I know we do a lot to help people in the community and different topics have different audiences. Um, we've talked about budgeting, we talked about savings, we talked about credit score, credit reporting and online resources. Um, and just as a reminder, in our partnership with the Office of Economic Empowerment, you can go to their website and if you work for a facility or an agency, you're like, you know, this would be fun in person. This would be great to do in front of an audience or maybe we'll do a webinar specifically for my facility. Feel free to reach out to OE and Jessica. We can schedule those. Jordan and myself love to drive around Massachusetts um, now that we can again. And if there's any type of additional education we can offer, uh, we'd be more than willing to do so. And at the end of the day, that's our overall goal is, is to help people make better decisions. Yes, thank you so much for that plug right there. I know that a lot of folks have asked about workshops um, coming out of these. Um, and like Dutch just said, yes, those are free. The Office of Economic Empowerment partners specifically with folks like M&T Bank um, and financial planners to get workshops to your communities when they feel like they need it. Um, so for example, we're going up to HSPAN soon and, and the North Shore to give some workshops. We've done some work with other council on aging, libraries, things like that. Um, so definitely feel free to register for a workshop for your community, especially scam and fraud is a very popular topic, scam and fraud prevention, and Dutch does a fantastic in-depth presentation on scam and fraud as well. So definitely feel free to visit the link that I sent in the chat or email me at my email and we can set something up or have more conversations too. Can I add one comment in closing if I might? Um, one of the most common questions I get for people is when should I get pre-approved? I know Dutch is talking about making sure you get yourself educated first. And when you think you're there, many times I'll talk to someone, they'll say, well, I'm going to lease and it ends in six or eight months. I'll call you in six or eight months. What I always like to say is let's look at it now. So when we get to six or eight months, you have a realistic expectation of what you can get approved for. Because sometimes people will come to me and say, well, I want to pay down my debt. And they'll come to me after they took $5,000 to pay off a student loan, but then they have no down payment. So I'll say, had you come to me first or, or Jim, what we would have done is told you that $5,000 is more important as a down payment than paying off debt. So I always suggest as soon as you're starting to think in your mind that you, you, know, you want to go down this path, getting pre-approved, once you're educated, don't wait the six or eight months till your lease ends. Get it done now. Have someone like myself or Jim look and help you figure out that plan so that in six or eight months, you're approved for a higher amount. We'll help educate you on that. So don't think you should wait till your lease is up because the only other part in this is finding a home sometimes takes a long time. So the earlier you can get pre-approved, the earlier you can get pre-qualified to figure out that dollar amount, get you looking at a more exact target for where you need to be and then set up realistic expectations. So that's it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, for that insight. We appreciate it. And okay, if anybody else has any other questions that pop up, feel free to let us know, email us. We're here for you whenever. Um, and thank you again to you all for attending this session. And if you've attended any of the previous workshops, we appreciate you sticking with us. So thank you again to our M&T presenters. And I will give you all five minutes of your morning back. Use it to have some coffee and pat yourself on the back. <laughs> okay, thanks all.